an early morning run, followed by an afternoon sword training session and an evening gym workout. This was my daily workout routine for the past 15 days. When I resigned from my job to go on a crazy fitness spree, everyone thought I had lost my mind, but only I knew the truth, the world would end in 15 days. This information came from my Sage's status window guide, allowing me to see further into the future than anyone else. Fifteen days ago, rumors of monsters appearing around the world were rampant, but the truth was always kept under wraps. That day, as I was walking home from work, I came across a live stream video about someone who found a monster in the forest and didn't expect the video to be that realistic. It has to be fake though. My name is Lee Ho Young. Life already seemed tough enough, who had the energy to care about possibly fake news from miles away? There are too many faked videos online recently though. Suddenly, a wounded monster appeared before me. I couldn't believe that such a monster really existed. To my shock, it asked for my help. I was ready to run as it looked kinda scary, but its pitiful demeanor froze me in place. Was it trying to gain my sympathy by acting cute even though it still looked kind of scary? Despite it showing me a family photo, indicating it had loved ones waiting, I knew I couldn't help. I wasn't about to be foolishly compassionate towards a monster. I turned to leave, but its cries echoed in my mind. Damn it. Alright, just this once. I couldn't believe I actually ended up helping it, and in return, it gave me a mysterious pill. A mysterious hologram also appeared in front of me, indicating that the pill is called Silver Goblin's Pill. As I pondered the bizarre day, I watched the news, unknown buildings were appearing worldwide, and the armies sent to explore them never returned after entering the towers. Just as I wondered if this was the beginning of an apocalypse, a large explosion occurred nearby and one of the towers suddenly appeared in the city center. Maybe the world is entering the apocalypse, and I won't know whether this is the right decision, but perhaps swallowing the pill was perhaps the craziest thing I could do in a time like this. The moment it touched my tongue, a golden light enveloped me. A system prompt appeared, informing me that the Sage's Window Status Guide had been activated early. It would now provide me with the guide with the highest survival rate for my current situation. A holographic book materialized in my hands, and as I flipped through it, a message displayed, the gates to the apocalypse will open in 15 days, 4 hours, 12 minutes, and 52 seconds. Prepare yourself. It recommended strength training, cardio exercise, and combat skills practice. I decided to follow the guide's advice. As an orphan, I had nothing to lose anyway and I spent the remaining 15 days preparing myself. As the countdown hit zero, I was transported to a dense forest. Finally, the mysteries began to unravel. Holographic information flashed before me, tutorial begins. Aptitude test completed. Suitable class assignment in progress. Your profession, combat swordsman. The interface showed an overwhelming number of messages. Thankfully, I was familiar with such displays. My attributes were as follows, level 1, basic swordsmanship, sage's status window. Stamina 14, strength, 11, agility, 7 and sensitivity 8. Remaining skill points, 0, luckily, a blunt sword was also conveniently provided next to me. The tasks also appeared before me. Objective 1, survive in the forest for 60 minutes. Objective 2, find the exit and escape. Although completing either task would end the trial, the Sage's status window suggested killing as many creatures as possible within the 60 minutes. Escaping, it warned, would hinder my growth. I guess this was why the guide asked me to exercise to prepare for this situation. I knew that I have to hunt the monsters and not run away as it said. As the tutorial began, I encountered the first monster, a level 1 one-horned raccoon. It looked cute, but its face suddenly turned aggressive when it attacked. As it jumped towards me, I struck with basic swordsmanship, killing it instantly, gaining some experience points. Using this skill drained two of my 10 MP, meaning I could only use it five times before running out and conserving it was essential while I hunt. One by one, the raccoons fell. Finally, the level up notification appeared, indicating that I had reached level two, restoring my health and magic. The timing was perfect as I had just used up all my MP. But then, the system notified me that leveling up would be harder for me due to the possession of the sage's status window and I was turned back to level 1. Despite this challenge, I found an advantage for this situation, the attribute points I gained when I leveled up were still available. If what I was thinking was correct, this wasn't a punishment but an overpowered bug ability. As I continuously hunted, my level went back down to level 1 and my remaining attribute points increased as expected. Given that more experience points are needed to level up to the next level, this would make it an easier way to accumulate attribute points. There are four choices for raising my stats. 
As a combat swordsman, I guess that strength and agility would make the most sense as strength is needed for stronger attacks while agility would increase my speed and reflexes. However, the most important stats for me right now is sensitivity. The raccoons themselves were not hard to kill, the challenge was locating them within the 60 minute time frame. After allocating all the points to sensitivity, I could now sense even the faintest energy signatures, making it easier to find the raccoons. Soon, the system notified me that I had defeated all monsters and a hidden mission was activated, which was to defeat the level 2 one-horned raccoon alpha. I was shocked when it suddenly appeared and lunged at me. I barely dodged its swift attack, realizing its speed and destructive power were formidable. I reminded myself to stay calm. Although this creature was different from the tutorial monsters, it still followed simple behavioral patterns and its charging path was predictable. As it charged again, I sidestepped and used basic swordsmanship to slice through its midsection. Remaining calm and dodging its charges made it possible to defeat it. My true level was 7 after all. The system notified me, you have defeated the one-horned raccoon alpha. Hidden mission completed. I exhaled deeply, relieved that the ordeal was over. Or so I thought. In the next moment, more figures appeared around me as I had been transported to a new area. An announcement echoed through the hall, welcome, everyone. You have completed the tutorial. This is the tower lobby for region C2567. I looked around, seeing 14 men and 11 women. These must be the ones who completed the tutorial. Everyone seemed disoriented and panicking, which was understandable. The world had turned upside down in just one day. If I hadn't known about the impending apocalypse, I would have been equally panicked. Some handled the situation better, like the blonde girl nearby who questioned where we were. Suddenly, a rabbit in a tuxedo appeared, saying, Welcome to the Tower of the End. I am Kum Kum, the lower floor manager. Everyone was startled by the rabbit's sudden appearance. Many questioned if it was the one who brought us here. At this time, I had a more pressing question, if this was truly the apocalypse, what should we do next? The rabbit explained, you 24 players here have been chosen to participate in this game with your lives on the line. The rest of humanity is facing the same fate. Your task is to work together, conquer each floor, and reach the top of the tower. I quickly asked, does that mean if we reach the top, we can return to our normal lives? Kum Kum replied indifferently, who knows? Seeking meaning in such matters is pointless. If you don't climb the tower, you will die. After all, many have already perished in the tutorial. His casual mention of death made everyone fall silent. Despite the tutorial being relatively simple, it was clear that people had died in the beginner's levels. Kum Kum continued, anyone willing to kill me? I need to die to return home, and the person who helps will receive a special reward. Any volunteers? Everyone suspected it was a trap. Although Kum Kum appeared weak, it was undeniable that he was level 55. I decided to observe quietly. Surprisingly, the guide suggested helping Kum Kum return home. Attack the rabbit? So far, the guide's instructions had been accurate, but this seemed too risky. As I pondered what my next step should be, a player stepped forward, saying, I'll kill you. If you want to die so badly, don't regret it. He drew his sword, but Kum Kum watched passively, as if it was waiting for something. In the next instant, a massive fist struck the player, sending blood everywhere. The crowd was horrified. Kum Kum, who had turned into a towering muscular figure, coldly stated, I never said I wouldn't fight back. Everyone was paralyzed with fear, including me. That could have been me if I had volunteered. Kum Kum reverted to his original form and extended his invitation once more, asking for other volunteers. Anyone else want to kill Kum Kum and send me home early? Did the guide lie to me? His muscular form seemed unbeatable, but my sage's eye suddenly activated, allowing me to view other status windows. Why did it appear all of a sudden now? I immediately used the sage's eye, revealing all of Kum Kum's details. Ah, now it made sense. As no other player stepped up, I volunteered. The rabbit rubbed his chin, acknowledged my name as Li Ho Young who was just level 1 and asked why I was helping. Does the level matter in this situation? I retorted. With no other comments, Kum Kum spread his hands and said, go ahead and please send me home. Others tried to dissuade me, warning of the danger. But I assured them, you're about to see something interesting. Kum Kum's cute facade disappeared as he transformed into his aggressive form. I stood firm, not dodging his giant fist. From the start, he mentioned there were 24 of us, but I was certain there were 25. However, as a level 55 monster that could easily kill us, that was an intentional mistake and his strength and level were all just a deliberate misdirection meant to instill fear. There was in fact just 24 players here and the player who died was just an illusion. 
As I struck Kum Kum, he began to fade away, confirming my theory that this was just a hologram, not his real form. Well done, he said, good luck to those with courage. He dropped a crystal stat point, which I picked up. The crowd couldn't believe that it was just an illusion and asked how I figured it out. I explained that I saw the player's blood pass through Chai E. Seol. If it were real, she'd be covered in blood, but she wasn't. I fabricated this plausible explanation, knowing it was better than revealing everything to strangers. Suddenly, a muscular man, level 4 Kim Se Yong appeared and scoffed, you just got lucky. If I had noticed, I would have stepped up first. It would be a waste for you to have that crystal since you are just a level 1 who probably ran away during the tutorial. Since I would most likely just die quickly, I should just give that crystal to him, I couldn't believe hearing this. I ignored him and absorbed the crystal's energy. Congratulations, you gained one attribute point, the system announced. Sorry, but submission isn't my style, I said, preparing for his attack. From experience, avoiding such people was best, but how long could I maintain this strategy? An announcement interrupted us, distributing our starting coins based on our tutorial performance. My highest score of 7,400 coins stunned everyone as most only received around 1,400. I couldn't reveal I was the top scorer, as jealousy was already evident. Coins serve three purposes, buying items in the shop, upgrading skills, and boosting stats. I increased all my attributes to 20. I also bought some clothes to replace my gym outfit. Just as I had also upgraded my basic swordsman skill to 2, the healer named Chai E. Seol approached, wanting to ask me for some advice as she was impressed with my bravery earlier. The sage's eyes showed her stats clearly. She honestly revealed her gold and after briefing asking her some random question, I suggested she improve her stamina. She agreed, appreciating the advice. Another announcement stated the first floor mission would start soon, requiring three-man teams. Those without a team would be randomly assigned in 30 minutes. Teaming up this early was faster than I had expected. As level 4 Kim Joon Song proposed to reveal our classes to each other since we could only see each other's levels, people began forming teams with classes that they wanted. I was surprised when Chai E. Seol asked to team up with me. I had no reason to refuse since she was a healer. Despite having a healer, others refused my invitations, probably looking down on my level 1 status. As 30 minutes passed, we did not manage to find the third member. Random assignment it was. We ended up with Kim Se Yong, who immediately complained about being tagged to a level 1 player. Even though he was level 4, I didn't expect him to be even less popular than me, likely due to his personality. Knowing cooperation was crucial for survival, I resolved to make this team work despite our differences. Our survival mission was to destroy the Cobalt tribe within 12 hours. Due to my apparent low level 1, Kim Se Yong saw me as a dead weight and planned to handle the whole Cobalt tribe by himself. As there was no way to convince him otherwise, I decided to let him be. Even Chai E. Seol was concerned whether this party quest would go on smoothly. As we moved towards the tribe, I looked around and noticed that there were a lot of bugs around busy consuming the apples on the trees. As I noticed something strange, Chai E. Seol interrupted my thoughts. She asked my thoughts on the cobalt monsters but I told her not to worry as while it should be stronger than a one-horned raccoon, it should still be manageable since we are still on level 1. However, my expectations were completely crushed when I saw one of the kobolds, which was extremely muscular and obviously much stronger as compared to the adorable raccoon. I suggest that we scout the surroundings to understand the kobolds' positions, but Kim se Yong dismisses my idea, charging headfirst into battle. He attacks recklessly, taunting the lone kobold, drawing its ire. We were caught by surprise by his sudden attack which was extremely reckless. Chai E. Seol, embodying teamwork, immediately supports him with healing while he fights the kobold head-on. Even with his high strength, Kim se Yong struggles to deal significant damage. This perplexes me until the guide reveals that kobolds are passive creatures and would only attack when provoked. It seems like Kim se Yong's actions have agitated it, complicating our situation. As I continued to check on kobold status, I found something that could help with our situation. As the fight intensifies, Kim se Yong's brute force proves inadequate. When he accidentally destroyed a tree, it landed on another kobold nearby, drawing the aggression of another kobold. Facing two of them at the same time proved to be too challenging for Kim Se-yong. When he turned around to look for help, I was already nowhere to be seen and he thought I had run away like a coward. At this time, Chai E. Seol steps up, brandishing a sword to slash at a kobold to help him despite being a healer. However, as she was not used to combat, she lost her balance and fell to the ground. Just as things looked dire, an apple falls on the kobold's head, followed by my sword slashing through the apple, effectively hitting the kobold as it unexpectedly explodes. 
Kim se yong and Chai e Seol were both surprised at this. This has also confirmed my theory. When I noticed the bugs earlier, I saw that there were some fruits that were being avoided by all the bugs. It turns out these apples are poisonous, a detail the guide confirmed. As kobolds are highly vulnerable to poison, we can use it against them. Despite this, Kim se yong refused to acknowledge my help and thought that I had hidden at a corner when it was dangerous and only swooped in to steal the final hit after he had damaged the kobolds. I couldn't believe that he was this dense and thought he was going to have an even harder time. Collecting the poisonous apples, we devise a strategy to defeat the kobolds. With Chai E. Seol's help, we manage to turn the tide, easily cutting down the kobolds with the help of the poisonous apples. Kim se yong however, remains bitter and uncooperative, choosing to continue to fight the kobolds with brute force while Chai E. Seol and I bonded over our easier shared experiences. When Kim se yong was overwhelmed by the kobolds due to his stubbornness, I intervened in time just to save him, gaining his recognition. We finally cleared the mission. As we returned back to the lobby, Kim se yong began to reflect on the unpleasant memories. He couldn't believe that he had offered to serve a level 2 newbie and was resolved to keep this to himself. He began to have more internal conflicts as he didn't want others to find out about this but also knew that he couldn't go back on his words. Seeing that there wasn't anyone else around, we knew that we were the first group to complete the mission, which Chai E. Seol credited to my keen observation to use the poisonous apples. I humbly gave her support some credit as I felt like I was cheating with my sage's guide. Soon, other teams started returning, they must have discovered the poisonous apples too. Unfortunately, many of their members didn't make it back as more and more teams returned without their full team. The first floor task is declared complete, and the announcement sinks everyone's spirits. Out of our group, there were eight players who had failed to return. I couldn't believe that so many of them had died already. How many more will die as we climb the tower? Rewards are calculated and distributed based on our achievements. Teams who return with all members and the first team gets 1,000 gold coins, with a total of 2,000 extra coins. Compared to the tutorial, these rewards are lower, but these extra coins would act as my insurance for my future survival and I knew I needed to save as much as possible. Everyone is curious which team got first place and I knew we couldn't hide it since the second team saw who had returned first. Just as I thought I couldn't hide my abilities any longer, Kim se yong quickly claimed the credit. His arrogance protected me from any further attention, yet it only stirs more jealousy and suspicion, thinking that I was just a freeloader who got lucky and got the extra 2000 gold for doing nothing. Chai E. Seol wanted to defend me but I asked her not to waste her energy as her efforts would be futile. The second team led by the level 8 Kim Joon Song tried to boost morale, emphasizing the need to focus on our own survival. Seo Joon Ho also tried to ask the others to keep pushing and continue on for those we've lost and their leadership rallies everyone. Just as hope rekindles, the hall's alarms blare, signaling an imminent punishment mission for our zone, which has a lower than average survival rate. A chilling announcement follows, we must choose someone to undertake a death mission within the next five minutes. If no one is chosen, the system will pick at random. Panic ensued as the countdown began and no one wanted to be the one chosen and was also conflicted on who to choose. Chai E. Seo proposed that everyone vote for themselves to nullify the choice, but it's quickly challenged as no one knew whether this could work. Arguments erupt among the survivors, and under pressure, a vote was cast. It turned out that Seo Jun Ho had casted his vote for me and he was shocked to find out that the votes were not anonymous. While I expected this to happen, I was still taken aback. Soon, I find myself the target, with the votes casted against me increasing. It's because I was perceived as the weakest due to my low level. Ironically, I was probably one of the strongest with my additional attributes. Chai E. Seol couldn't believe that they would do this to me but I knew that in this moment of crisis, their true natures surface. As the countdown nears its end, even Kim se yong voted for me excitedly, revealing his true feelings toward me despite what we had gone through. The reality of this world is stark and brutal, survival is a test of both skill and morality. As the death mission portal opened, its sacrificial lamb had been selected as I walked towards it. Looking at all the faces of guilt and relief behind me, I had no choice as the selected one. However, only I knew this was not the end of my journey. The sage's guide had assured me that completing this task will bring great rewards and I had a high chance of clearing the mission. This was not a trap, but an opportunity. With this assurance, I faced the challenge ahead. After I entered the portal, only Chai E. Seol seemed genuinely distressed. When Kim Joon Song tried to check on my teammates, he thought it was regretful that they had to choose me in the end. Kim Se Yong was already claiming credit for the success with the tutorial quest with the Kobol tribe, while discrediting me as someone who just got lucky. Despite Chai E. Seol's attempts to defend me, her efforts were futile. 
Kim se yeom would never admit that he was saved by me. Realizing she couldn't convince the others, she placed her trust in my ability to handle the death mission. Meanwhile, I found myself in the midst of the punishment mission, a death mission. The kobold tribe from earlier appeared, but the landscape was darker and more ominous with the corpses of the kobolds we killed earlier lying around. While joining the death mission was my plan, I couldn't help thinking of Kim se yongs attempt to land the final blow even when the vote was already decided. I would need to teach him a lesson once I am back. Soon, more kobolds appeared behind me. The task was clear, defeat the kobold chieftain, a level 12 opponent, along with numerous other kobolds. However, they still had the same weakness, vulnerability to poison. If it weren't for this, the task would be insurmountable for anyone but me who still had the poisonous apples. A level 12 boss monster would be an impossible task for others but my abilities far exceeded this. My agility and poison stained sword allowed me to swiftly defeat one kobold after another. Soon, the only one left was the chieftain, whose immense strength and combat intelligence were formidable. My initial attacks barely scratched him as he was smart enough to pull back at the time of impact to reduce the force. Unexpectedly, it began running away but it was fine for me as I could just slash its back, slowly cutting down on its health. Just when I thought it would soon be over, the chieftain stopped and my attack was not able to break its defense. It was looking up at the strange bright red moon when it suddenly attacked me, catching me off guard and landing a critical hit. Back in the lobby, Kim se yong continued to boast, oblivious to my struggle, promising to carry the rest of them for the other floors. He scoffed at Chai E. Seol who was still praying for my safety, telling her that it was pointless since I must be dead already. Their argument was interrupted by the activity at the portal, followed by my reappearance, severely wounded. The sight of my injuries silenced the hall, hinting at the brutal battle I had just endured. Earlier, the guide warned me that the kobold chieftain's abilities would increase when their eyes turned red but he had already landed a critical hit. With its health dropping due to being poisoned, I knew that I just needed to land one more attack. I could barely dodge its powerful attack which would have killed me if it hit. My sword couldn't penetrate its defenses, and with my health critically low, I realized I needed a new strategy. An idea struck me, using precision over power. I had only been using the sword to slash at monsters but there was another way. I leveraged the chieftain's own momentum against it as it rushed towards me, focusing my attack on one single point. Finally, in a decisive moment, my attack was able to pierce through the chieftain's armor as I gained a new attack, slash, under my basic swordsmanship. The system also confirmed my victory as the chieftain fell. Chai E. Seol, filled with relief and tears, ran towards me, expressing her unwavering belief in my return. Unexpectedly, Kim se yong who had been mocking me earlier, rushed ahead of her to welcome me back, albeit reluctantly. Kim se yong was overly eager to show loyalty and flatter me, stunning me. If I could, I'd knock him down a peg. He hadn't expected me to survive and make it back safely. Just then, another player stepped forward and asked me that if I had made it back alive, I must have gained a lot of experience in the death mission. So why am I still at level 2? Many of them began to question the authenticity of the death mission and it could be fake like the rabbit illusion. This reminded me of my childhood as an orphan, always underestimated and assumed to be cheating, despite my hard work. They would want to see the weak remain weak after all. People often think there's no risk in stepping on someone already down. I was all too familiar with such malicious thoughts towards me. People don't easily change their prejudices. The only thing I needed to do now was endure as explanations would only invite more attacks. How can you keep doubting Li Ho Young? Hasn't he proved himself by surviving the death mission? Chai E. Seol attempted to defend me again. Surprisingly, Kim se Yong also stood up for me, you idiots. How dare you ruin the mood instead of celebrating the glorious return of my big bro. Despite his crazy behavior, I felt reassured of their support. Regardless, I needed to show them something tangible to convince the rest. I'll show you something, I said, summoning a crimson blade from my storage space. This sword, gained by killing the kobold chieftain, has a rare attribute that increases attack power by 15%. Everyone was stunned. Such a high-level weapon was far more persuasive than words. Finally, Kim Joon Song stepped forward, congratulating me for my success. This is indeed an impressive reward. You've done well, he acknowledged. This weapon will help us with our survival more than experience or level. I stopped him and reminded them. Our success. You all seem to have forgotten forcing me into a death mission, I replied. The crowd fell silent. Seo Joon Ho slowly walked over. You're right, he admitted. I justified my action as I thought it was inevitable to vote for the lowest level, even knowing it was a death sentence. I'm sorry. 
He bowed down and asked for my forgiveness, expressing his genuine relief that I managed to make it back alive. Another Karen broke the awkward silence, someone has to go anyway. You brought back a rare reward, didn't you? Didn't everything turn out okay in the end? Say Jun Ho snapped, how can you say that? Do you have no shame and guilt? You don't have the right to criticize me. You voted too, she retorted. Seeing the argument escalating, I intervened, this isn't about blame. We must ensure this never happens again. It has become clear of the tower's intention to divide us, fostering mistrust and conflicts within ourselves, which is more dangerous than any external threat. My words hushed the crowd. We should see my return as an opportunity, as proof of our potential, I continued. We can defy the tower's divisions. We must find ways to achieve mutual success and climb higher together and hopefully one day we can get our lives back again, the atmosphere shifted to one of determination and unity. Chai E. Seo echoed my sentiments, we must cooperate to succeed. Fear divides us, but hope can unite us. Even Seo Jun Ho was amazed by my kindness and regretted judging me solely by my levels. Kun Kun the rabbit reappeared and interrupted us, an inspiring speech, but the next mission is a survival game. Everyone turned to him, shocked by his appearance. He then announced that the next mission would be a taste of a battle royale. He began to explain the rules. In the level 2 mission, there will be 16 players and their doppelgangers and our mission is to eliminate all doppelgangers. They will not only have the same stats but also the same memories as well. The key points are, when players kill doppelgangers, they will not receive any rewards while killing other players grants stat points and gold. This meant that this could be an opportunity for players as well, suggesting we kill each other. In addition, every 30 minutes, if no one is killed, everyone will be summoned back to the lobby to face a massive disaster. As he snapped his finger, a portal opened, revealing a monstrous beast. He expects us to fight that, someone gasped. The whole lobby was in ruins with just one attack from the monstrous beast. This was literally a disaster. Everyone began to panic after what they went through during the first round. The situation was getting bad as everyone was in full panic and scrambling for cover. The beast launched its punch at a player and he was barely saved by me. I couldn't believe that Kum Kum is letting this happen when the second mission hasn't even begun. Was it putting up a show to get us to be serious about the mission? Just when I thought it was not actually trying to harm us, it landed another attack at the players, disproving my hypothesis. Jun Song and Se Yong attempted to fight back but to no avail. It seems like I was wrong and it is really trying to kill us. No one has died yet thanks to Chai E. Seol's healing but she won't be able to last much longer. As it attempted to land another attack, I knew I couldn't hide my true power anymore, regardless of what the others might think. I urged the others to stand back while I prepared to attack. Perhaps with the new blade and the new skill stab, I could really deal some damage. Focusing all my energy at this one attack, I launched a stab skill at its fist. Suddenly, the monster disappeared into thin air, catching me by surprise. Everyone was shocked as well and they soon began to cheer for me. I did not expect the attack to be that strong. Soon, the guide notification appeared, informing me that I will be in an exhausted state as I had used strength beyond my limits. I began to feel dizzy and collapsed to the ground, my body drained of energy. When I woke up, the exhaustion had passed and I was surrounded by everyone. Seo Jun Ho was touched that I had acted so humbly after witnessing my true strength. I then asked where the disaster went and Kum Kum explained that it was sent back since it was just meant to let us have a taste. He was disappointed that everyone was being friendly with each other and reminded us that with the survival match beginning soon, the person next to us could be the one who would kill us and everyone began to realize the truth in his words. Seeing that his words had achieved the intended results, he bid us goodbye as the mission would start soon. Everyone began to discuss what we should all do during the event. Putting a mark on each other would not work since the doppelgangers share our memories. Amidst the confusion, I voiced my plan. I suggested that during the event, only I would do the killing while everyone else just gathered at the highest place on the second floor. Anyone else that does that would be considered a doppelganger that should be defeated. This plan would be the best solution. A level 9 on say change, a former soldier, appeared and asked if that was really my plan. Karen did not think that they should all listen obediently to my plan even though I was very strong. I then reminded them of Kum Kum's words. Although the goal was to defeat the doppelgangers, the tower really wanted us to kill each other. Unexpectedly, Jun Song was the first to approve my plan as the best way to minimize the losses but he questioned whether I had a way of differentiating a doppelganger. I nodded confidently, confirming his theory and soon, the survival mission began. With the mission officially underway, we were transported into a dense forest. Kim se Yong cursed as he made his way to the rendezvous point. Suddenly, he heard footsteps approaching. 
He quickly hid behind a tree but was easily spotted and it turned out to be me. Just as he greeted me excitedly, a blade sliced through the air as Sei Yong's body was split into two. While there were many ways to kill, sometimes, a single strike was the most effective. When the mission began, the guide sent me a message, the first player to reach a certain level in the sensitivity attribute would be rewarded with the impeccable senses skill. This skill would be able to help identify doppelgangers. At the time, even though I claimed I could identify doppelgangers, I was not confident at all. This skill and message came at the perfect timing. I began to spend my gold to increase the sensitivity stat. When I increased it up to 50 after spending half of my gold, I finally acquired the impeccable senses skill. This skill allowed me to gather detailed information of a person within a certain range around me. It was an incredible feeling, as if my understanding of the world had been improved. Even from a hundred meters away, I could clearly hear Kim Se Young's voice. My hearing had improved tremendously thanks to the skill. Suddenly, I smelled a terrible stench from him. It was clear that he was a doppelganger. The system announcement about the doppelganger's death played just as he died. His reaction up until the moment of his death made me suspect that he wasn't aware of his identity. I had no choice but to hope everyone followed my advice and gathered without any troubles. It was thanks to Jun Song's leadership that everyone had agreed to follow the plan. Then, the system notified us of a player's death. Has the killing already started? Was it a doppelganger or another player? I thought, realizing we needed to find the murderer quickly. I rushed towards a high vantage point to find out where the murderer was. Another player's death occurred as I killed another doppelganger. Soon, my heightened senses spotted the doppelganger standing before a murdered player. Found you. I said as I rushed forward, not hesitating as I struck down Go Yong Wu's doppelganger. My biggest fear was that my doppelganger might compete with me, turning it into a duel between us, but fortunately, the killer wasn't my doppelganger and I was glad that I could stop it before any more damage was done. As I examined the wounds of the killed player, I realized that it wasn't Yong Wu's doppelganger who did it, the killer was someone else. The arrow wounds indicated a skilled archer. In the distance, my enhanced senses identified the person as Kim Jun Song who was pointing his arrow at me. He was injured in the shoulder by an arrow as he asked me to identify myself Realizing that he was not a doppelganger, I walked cautiously towards him while maintaining a safe distance. He asked me to stop, cautious of my presence since he could not distinguish who is a doppelganger. I revealed that I had just killed a doppelganger, which should be proof enough. He began to lower his guard and soon collapsed to the ground, likely due to his injuries. As I carried him on my shoulders, he apologized for letting his doppelganger escape and caused the death of other players. I comforted him, telling him that it was not his fault as we are all victims of the tower and should just focus on escaping the tower alive. Suddenly, Seo Jun Ho and Chai E Seol appeared. Thank goodness, you're alive, E Seol said. We were worried as two players were already dead. Are you hurt? We'll treat you. As she stepped forward to heal us, I stood in front of Jun Song, warning him that they are both doppelgangers and their faces tensed up. Showing their true colors, Seo Jun Ho drew his sword and they both charged at us. Seo Jun Ho began to attack me while Chai E Seol charged towards Jun Song. Suddenly, a question arose in my mind. If the doppelgangers inherited our memories, why would Chai E Seol's doppelganger directly confront us, knowing how strong I am? Before I could think further, Chai E Seol suddenly attacked from behind, and Seo Jun Ho's strike followed. Unexpectedly, I sensed an arrow flying towards me and I dodged, narrowly avoiding a lethal blow. Kim Jun Song finally revealed his true face, showing disappointment that I managed to survive. One would never think that the two doppelgangers are actually working with Kim Jun Song. As it turns out, when I killed one of the doppelgangers, Kim Jun Song was observing from afar. Many would believe that murdering people was unthinkable for someone who was so seemingly kind like Kim Jun Song. He used to be a fisherman on a deep sea trawler, and enjoyed fishing and luring his targets in with bait. Watching those who fell into his trap struggle in despair was his greatest pleasure. As he stabbed himself with his own arrows, he had set a trap to lure me in. His hypocritical facade was finally stripped away, revealing a cruel and smug smile. He was almost too excited. I'm very curious, how do you feel now? Betrayed, desperate, or angry, he taunted. My calm expression frustrated him. What's wrong with you? You speak as though you knew I was going to backstab you, he asked, clearly annoyed. I had already suspected him when I noticed his sudden surge in power from the status window, so I waited patiently. He was caught by surprise when I revealed my ability to see people's status and asked if I had received the favor of the tower. Why are gold and rewards so important that you'd kill for them? I questioned him. He laughed maniacally again. 
why do I need a reason here? Here, there are no punishments, only rewards for killing others. This is a wonderful world. I am better suited to live here than you. How could I not kill? His words were followed by another arrow shot, reinforcing the contrast between his earlier friendliness and his true nature. I had wondered if he was forced into such a situation but it turned out that he was just a crazy murderer. I dodged the arrow, and as I charged toward them, I was met with the attacks of the doppelgangers of Seo Jun Ho and Chai E Seo. As I was distracted by them, Jun Song fired double arrows at me, catching me by surprise as I destroyed one of them and could only barely dodge the other. The arrow was so powerful that it pierced through the tree behind me and I realized that he hasn't shown all of his cards yet. Fighting against two of the strongest fighters and healers together with a ranged attacker, they are indeed an ultimate combination to be reckoned with. Though I didn't know how he controlled their doppelgangers, their ambush was well prepared. Kim Jun Song's smug expression grew more arrogant, confident of his victory. Even though he expected me to go down much easier, he was excited that I put up such a challenge for him. He notched three arrows and fired them at me while the doppelgangers charged with renewed vigor, utilizing their teamwork to try and take me down. As I activated my impeccable senses, I acknowledged that they were indeed formidable and a well-balanced team. However, against overwhelming power with my stats at least double of theirs, their perfect teamwork was futile. I swiftly cut down the Jun Ho doppelganger before they had time to heal him and turned to cut down Chai E Seol before she could utilize her healing spell. With that, the number of doppelgangers decreased to eleven. Kim Jun Song stared at the scene in disbelief as he collapsed to the ground in panic. I just got obsessed with the rewards and wanted to match your strength so badly that I did something unforgivable. Please, spare me, he pleaded, tears streaming down his face. Suddenly, he charged at me with an arrow in his hand, attempting to launch a sneak attack at me but I was prepared for his betrayal. With one swift strike, his life was ended. The fisherman who loved to lure and trap his prey had finally caught something he couldn't handle. As the system notified me about the death of a player, I stood in silence, still processing the shock of having to kill a living human. Suddenly, another notification appeared, informing me that the player who attempted the challenge of becoming a star killer had died. Since I was the one who killed that player, I now had the chance to become the star killer myself. If I accepted the challenge, my stats would be significantly boosted, I'd receive support from the doppelgangers, and I'd gain a tremendous benefit if I succeeded. A swirl of energy surrounded me, forming the shape of a devilish woman who offered her hand as the system asked if I wished to take up the challenge. I was shocked but quickly realized this was how Jun Song commanded the doppelgangers. The list of benefits was incredibly tempting. Although I disliked the idea of killing doppelgangers, I could manage it since they weren't truly human. However, facing an actual player aiming to become a star killer, or worse, an actual star killer, was a different matter. Despite the advantages, I refused the challenge, determined not to become a psychopath like Jun Song. Upon reaching the rendezvous point, I saw Kim Se Yong's reaction and briefly questioned my decision not to become a star killer. I thanked everyone for following the plan and meeting up. The players were nervous, realizing their doppelgangers were indistinguishable from them and doubting my ability to differentiate. Just as I was about to explain, a familiar voice sounded behind me, my doppelganger. The players were shocked to see two of me and questioned if I had anticipated this. Facing my doppelganger, I knew the situation had become more complicated. My initial plan to kill my doppelganger had been thwarted by Jin Xiong. Now it was a game of chess between me and my doppelganger. One of the players asked us to explain the situation and identify the dead doppelgangers. There were currently eight players, either dead or with dead doppelgangers. Revealing the identities of the five doppelgangers I had killed would prove my authenticity. As I listed the five dead doppelgangers, my doppelganger surprisingly named three dead players instead, suggesting they were the dead doppelgangers. He argued that it was too coincidental that I had found and killed Seong and E. Seol's doppelgangers first. This made the other players suspicious, thinking it might be a trick for me to gain an advantage. My doppelganger then added that if I were telling the truth, it meant I had killed the real Jun Song myself. Jun Song, known as the highest level among us and a real leader, had always given them courage. He then questioned whether I could be trusted even if I were the real Hoyang, having killed a player myself. His words stunned everyone, causing them to ponder. Although the doppelganger didn't know how the real Jun Song died, he turned the situation to his advantage, making it seem like I was the impatient one losing the group's trust. Karen, blinded with rage, suggested beating me up and killing the rest of the doppelgangers later. Jun Ho, Se Yong, and E Seol urged them not to jump to conclusions after hearing only one side since that would suggest that they are the doppelgangers as well. I remained silent, internally praising my doppelganger for making the best move he could make with the limited information. Unexpectedly, I stepped forward and confessed to killing Jun Song. 
The doppelganger, surprised, thought I was giving up. However, I still had a move to make. The doppelganger didn't know why Jun Song was dead. Unexpectedly, I charged at Jun Song's doppelganger and slashed at him, announcing that I killed Jun Song because he was a traitor. As Jun Song's doppelganger fell to the ground, Karen was furious. My doppelganger also summoned his weapon and questioned my actions. Suddenly, Jun Ho spoke up, asking if Jun Song had killed humans. He realized that if his guess was correct, the one who slashed at Jun Song was the real me. This was because my plan to gather everyone here had created a situation where players had the upper hand. The doppelgangers could not kill people recklessly, as it would immediately reveal them once the system notifications appeared. Jun Ho knew that the real Ho Young, who could identify doppelgangers, could prove himself by killing a doppelganger in front of everyone. He asked me directly if Jun Song had killed humans. I confirmed his suspicions, revealing that Jun Song was a demon behind a mask, hiding his true nature and biding his time. Karen refused to believe my words, as the Jun Song she knew was kind and caring. Unable to forgive anyone who insulted him, she charged at me with her weapon. Unexpectedly, she was shot in the back with an arrow. It was Jun Song's doppelganger, who managed to kill another player even after being exposed and injured by me. I did not expect him to still have enough strength to move. As Jun Song's doppelganger laughed maniacally at our stunned reactions, he was defeated by another player hiding in the bushes. It was Sei Chang, the soldier, who apologized for doubting me and asked what we should do next. The other players, realizing that Jun Song was indeed a doppelganger, acknowledged me as the real Ho Young and also asked for guidance. This felt like deja vu, and I prepared to reveal the last part of my plan. Suddenly, my doppelganger appeared behind me for a sneak attack, as it was now or never. However, I managed to block the attack and explained the rest of my plan. We would use the remaining gold we had looted to raise our stats. Once that happened, we would be stronger than we were a day ago, and the doppelgangers would no longer be a match for us, as their stats should be the same as when we first entered the second floor. Soon, all but one doppelganger was left. The last one was Sei Chang's doppelganger, who, like him, was hiding in a nearby bush. After a swift attack, the final doppelganger was defeated, and we managed to clear the mission without any further casualties. Back at the lobby, Sei Chang hated that more people had died because of Jun Song. His feelings were understandable since he was part of Jun Song's party on the first floor. I was also disappointed, as my goal had been to clear the second floor without anyone dying. I then realized that other regions might have it worse, as they did not have someone like me with a guide and might even have someone who took on the path to become a star killer. Although I knew I was still weak, there must be a reason I had this special ability to read the guide. I vowed to protect everyone and save as many people as possible. Just then, Sei Chang appeared before me, thanking me for helping with their survival through my plan. He realized that I must have been given a special ability that slowed down my leveling, as I had contributed the most despite being only level 2. Seeing his cautiousness and decision-making abilities during the second floor, I knew he would be a great help to us next time. Suddenly, he bowed down to apologize for looking down on me earlier. Everyone else began to apologize to me as well. Sei Yong laughed, proclaiming that he had always known my true potential, while Yi Seol reminded him that she was the first to recognize how extraordinary I was. Sei Chang then proposed something to everyone, that I should be the one leading us going forward. Comforted by their trust in me, I graciously accepted this responsibility. Soon, the system began calculating the gold rewards based on everyone's contributions, and everyone was thrilled to receive additional gold. Even Sei Yong proudly announced that he had earned 2,000 gold. I was glad that everyone managed to get some gold because they followed my plan. I was even more pleased to see that I had received 12,500 gold from this as well. A system notification popped up, informing me that my shop's rank had increased since I had obtained more than 10,000 gold. I noticed that more items were now available, but I would need to continue increasing my shop's rank to purchase rarer items. I knew I needed to buy a skill to level up my basic swordsmanship to level 3. Recalling how I unknowingly used a higher level of swordsmanship earlier against the disaster and even fainted afterward, I realized it would be worth it to be able to use that level of swordsmanship again for just 5,000 gold. After buying what I needed, I shared some gold with Seol, catching her by surprise. Her contributions during the battles against the kobolds and the doppelgangers had been crucial. In a place where we were forced to take lives to survive, we were able to rely on each other thanks to her healing abilities. She graciously accepted the gold and vowed to become stronger as she leveled up her healing hands. I also gave some gold to Sei Yong, asking him to stop doing weird things and to keep up the good work. Since he was still competent, he would be useful to us if he became stronger. He vowed to obey all my commands in the future, 
but his reaction made me want to test out my level 3 basic swordsmanship skills right away. Soon, the third floor's mission began, and it was a siege battle. Looking at the castle in front of us, we were informed that there would be players from other regions. Our objective was to attack and secure the castle and occupy the altar within 24 hours. We had also received an unknown item called a return crystal that could only be used on the third floor. As they wondered if they needed to kill anyone and what the function of the return crystal was, I received a notification from the guide, and a plan came to mind. I asked Se Yong if he meant it when he said he would do anything I asked, drawing my sword. Soon, Se Yong began climbing up to the castle as per my request after I reassured him that he wouldn't die for real even if he got killed here. This was because the guide had informed me that the return crystal would send a player to the starting location when they died. As Se Yong arrived at the tower, he was greeted by a giant gate. Incentivized by my promise of 100 gold for doing reconnaissance for us, he vowed to destroy everything while he was there and began smashing at the gate, slowly breaking down its durability until it reached 0%. He realized that the castle gate was restored within two seconds after he had entered and noticed two guards at the top of the castle wall who did not make any move on him. He then saw an altar in the middle of the castle grounds with around 10 people there. Even though I had warned him not to kill anyone there as they would realize what the return crystal was used for, Se Yong, being greedy and thinking they were all scared of him, began to make his move. He was suddenly hit by a magic bullet in the face. He had no idea what had just happened as his head began to feel dizzy from the impact. He then noticed that the person standing on top of the altar was pointing a gun at him as he soon collapsed. When Se Yong was revived, I was shocked to hear from him that someone from the other team could be using a gun. As he confirmed that he was hit by a magic bullet, I wondered about the situation, as a gun shouldn't be a weapon that one could obtain right now since even Sei Chang, who was an elite soldier, did not have a gun as a weapon yet. I then realized the other possibility, it was a legendary item obtained when a player became a star killer, and I knew we had a tough fight coming up. Just then, E. C. O. came over and assured me not to worry as I would have her full support. The other players were also confident in my leadership. I smiled as I began to explain my plan for this mission. At nightfall, the other party in the castle was still standing guard. It seemed like they were all afraid of one single player, who was sitting on top of another player acting as her chair. Using my impeccable senses, I could detect the two players guarding the top of the castle walls, just as Se Yong had mentioned. Se Yong was sent to the castle again, but Seo asked if his reappearance would reveal the function of the return crystals to the enemies. I assured her they wouldn't be certain and might think it was something only Se Yong could do. Unexpectedly, the two guards began firing arrows at Se Yong, unlike the first time. Although this was unexpected, it provided me with an opportunity to attack. I cut through the arrows, jumped up to the castle walls, and cut down the two guards before they could react. Jun Ho knew we needed to swiftly defeat them this time before they figured out how to use the return crystal. Se Yong then led the rest of our group in a charge at the castle wall. He reminded them to follow closely after breaking down the gate as it might be restored again. Before he could break down the wall, a magic bullet unexpectedly pierced through the gate from the other side, destroying it permanently. Luckily, E. C. O. was there to heal Se Yong. The two injured guards laughed at my half-hearted mindset for letting them live, warning that the madwoman would take advantage of it. Looking at the woman below who fired the magic bullet, my worst fear was confirmed. She was indeed a star killer with very high stats, a level 13 swordsman named Sun Seo Yun. Her high level suggested she had probably killed many players on the second floor. She decisively fired a bullet at me after spotting me. Caught by surprise, I could only heal myself with a potion. I survived the bullet because I had prepared body armor in advance. I observed that each magic bullet consumes 10 MP, and if her shop rank was the same as mine, she shouldn't be able to buy any mana recovery items yet. I then jumped down the castle wall, knowing she could only cast 13 more magic bullets, and joined the rest in their charge to break through their defense. As we charged, bullets rained down on us, and some were hit. However, they remained fearless because we had already discussed how to get past the bullets to the altar. I explained calmly that she wouldn't be able to use those magic bullets infinitely since they likely consumed mana. The crucial point was how much mana she had. Each of us just needed to take one bullet for the team. One of us was hit by a bullet but withstood the damage due to wearing armor in advance and was immediately healed back to full health by E. Seol supporting us from the rear with her healing hands. Realizing the situation was not in her favor, Sun Seo Yun ordered her teammates to attack. This final battle would determine how things ended. We needed to get to the altar quickly, or our teammates would die because of the magic bullets. As the enemies charged at me, I swiftly knocked them unconscious without killing them while inching closer to the altar. Suddenly, a magic bullet flew directly at me, and Seo Jun Ho managed to block it with his sword, 
saving me. Seo Yun was surprised we managed to react to her shots but immediately followed up with a few shots at Jun Ho. I was frustrated as, despite Yi Seo's healing, more and more people were dying as the battle dragged on. More importantly, although Seo Yun definitely knew they would return even after dying, I couldn't believe she could make such a face while killing people. She was excited to meet such an interesting group and smirked, but her reaction enraged me. I immediately activated my level 3 swordsmanship and slashed through the enemies in front of me. Soon, I reached the altar and collided with her as we prepared for our final battle. Seeing me reach the altar, Se Yong proudly declared that victory was near and launched a powerful stone fist at the enemies. At the altar, Seo Yun questioned how I could be so strong at level 2, while I countered that it was even stranger for someone to be at level 13 this early in the tower. I had occupied the altar, and the system prompted me to remove the opposing player to complete the mission. I realized we needed three people to fully occupy the altar, so I charged at Seo Yun. She dodged all my attacks, pondering how I managed to react to her strikes. As I launched a stab at her, she jumped above me and fired more shots but missed completely, realizing I could be predicting her moves. One of our strongest players, Seo Jun Ho, was a genius professional table tennis player known for his ability to predict his opponent's moves. This skill helped him block a bullet for me earlier. Inspired by him, I learned to read and predict Seo Yun's shots. As I continued to dodge her bullets, I got close enough to launch a sword attack, cutting a pillar behind her in half. She blocked the attack with her gun, but her face was still cut, annoying her. As she realized I had higher stats, my teammates had already dealt with the rest of her team. Seeing Se Yong again, she understood the return crystal's ability was revival, but it was too late. Even if she had a skill to one-shot me, I believed I could withstand one hit and end the fight in the next move. As I braced for her next attack, she asked if I really thought we had one. I noticed her gold depleting as she leveled up her firing skill to level 4. I quickly followed up with an attack, but she managed to fire two shots at me, hitting me directly. I was instantly defeated, and my return crystal activated. Soon, the third floor mission ended, and we were sent back to the lobby. There, I noticed Se Yong's sad face and asked why he was upset. Despite our victory, he was disappointed with the amount of gold he received, feeling he had carried the team. Although I was hit by her consecutive shots, I managed to hit her with my sword at the same time. My teammates then occupied the altar to complete the takeover. Thinking about her gave me shivers, hoping we would never meet again. Suddenly, a portal appeared, showing the defeated group on the other side. The system informed us that the defeated group would now face the disaster as the giant monster emerged from the portal. The targets of the disaster were players who did not get a single kill. They begged for our help, but there was a barrier, and we could only observe in horror as the disaster attacked them. As the last player begged for our help, we were powerless to do anything. Soon, only one player in the other group was left, and the tower announced the reorganization of the group. To my shock, the sole survivor was the star killer who had now joined our group. I knew that was why I had felt uneasy earlier. The next level was set in an abandoned city. The tower announced that a disaster would descend upon the city in six hours. Our mission was to kill all the monsters that appeared throughout the city and secure the escape portal, which would randomly appear when we hunted the monsters. There would be a total of 20 portals, and we couldn't allow others to use our own portal. As the timer began, everyone felt excited to hunt monsters after the challenges of the second and third floors. Many believed there was no need to compete with each other since we only had 13 people. Se Yong wanted to hunt all the monsters and level up, but ECO warned that we couldn't let others use our portal. If one person opened multiple portals, some people wouldn't escape. The extra number of portals available was possibly a trap set by the tower. An Se Chang proposed that everyone should enter a portal once it opened, regardless of how many monsters they had killed, to avoid opening multiple gates. While Se Yong looked a little upset, everyone agreed to this plan. I was comforted that everyone was finally acting like a team and doing what needed to be done for the mission. The only problem was the star killer, who refused to follow instructions. She left the area after warning us not to give her any orders. Her reaction enraged us, and we considered ganging up on her. Earlier, when she first joined our group 12 hours ago, Se Yong was the first to confront her but was instantly defeated with a single punch. Everyone was shocked by her strength. I quickly warned her not to mess around since she was in our territory now. I couldn't believe I had to face a real star killer after killing a potential candidate. She came over to look at me, and I suddenly felt something strange, quickly widening the distance between us. Soon, I was notified that the star killer had designated me as her main target. As I wondered what that meant, the guide appeared, shocking me. She walked away as I processed the information from the guide. 
Back in the abandoned city, facing a familiar face, Sei Yong launched a punch at an orc, and unexpectedly, a portal appeared. He was disappointed it opened so quickly after defeating only a few monsters. An idea came to his mind, and he decided not to enter the portal as promised. As he turned a corner, he was surprised to find me waiting for him. The guilty look on his face made it clear he had done something wrong. Even as he tried to deny it, I knew he had opened a portal and quickly dragged him into it. I had anticipated this and saw it as one less problem to deal with. Earlier, the guide informed me what it meant when the Star Killer designated me as a target. When the Day of Blood came, the Star Killer's traits would be fully unlocked, and she would receive a significant reward for killing me. The guide suggested I level up fast to prepare for the day to come. Although I didn't know when the day would arrive, I knew it would be advantageous for the Star Killer and that many people would die. I swiftly cut down the orcs in front of me, knowing I needed to be as strong as possible before that day. Although I wanted to kill all the monsters first if I had the time, it wasn't possible when everyone else hadn't escaped yet. I also needed to be careful of Sun Seo Yun, who was likely killing monsters somewhere. As I navigated through the ruins, I was overwhelmed by a horrible smell. The guide appeared, and I learned that orcs that opened a portal stank much more than the rest. I instantly knew the orc behind me was the one. I charged towards it, and with a swing of my sword, I sliced it in half, and as expected, a portal appeared before me. Later, somewhere in the abandoned city, Seo Yun grew frustrated as I pretended not to find a portal yet. She couldn't believe my bad luck, but I insisted I had the worst luck and had never won anything in my life. She didn't know that I was intentionally avoiding orcs that open portals. I knew that she was annoyed as if I died here, it would be bad for her too, as she needed to kill me on the day of blood. As I cut through the orcs, I was glad to see the notifications indicating that more players were escaping smoothly. With only five portals left, I continued to complain, and she urged me to focus on finding a portal. Looking at the orcs that resembled a certain player, I felt both sorry and pleasantly refreshed after cutting one down. This conflicted feeling mirrored my relationship with Seo Yun, who was worried about me only so she could kill me later. Trying to hide her concerns, I asked how many portals she had opened. Although she had opened five, it was still within the buffer. Assuming the rest had opened one each, there would be three portals left. With only three portals left, the two of us were likely the only ones left in the city. With ten minutes left, it was time to split up. I urged her to go ahead while I continued to find a portal by myself, but she stopped me. Just when I thought she had realized my intentions, she began to stutter, and I sensed something was wrong. She then confessed she had forgotten the locations of the portal she opened. I couldn't believe her lack of direction. Soon, we finally completed the mission with my help, just in time. When we arrived at the lobby, I was greeted by Sei Yong's frightening face. Reacting unconsciously, I punched him into the walls, thinking my mission was not over. The rest were glad to see Seo Yun made it back safely. Seo Jun Ho welcomed her back, extending his hand, but she ignored him. As Seo Yun and Sei Yong fought, I wondered if I made the right move to help her. I thought this might make her indebted to me, but I knew I still had to be wary of her. Suddenly, Kum Kum appeared out of nowhere and was greeted with a bullet from Seo Yun, shocking everyone. Kum Kum regenerated next to Seo Yun and sent her flying into the wall, badly injuring her. I realized that Kum Kum had probably gone easy on her given his high stats, suggesting that the Star Killer was very important to the tower. He then eagerly announced that it was time for the next mission. Just before the next mission began, Kum Kum snapped his fingers, transforming the lobby into a library. He explained that we were to choose one book each that could either help us survive or be useless and get us killed, so we were advised to choose wisely. As everyone began contemplating what books to pick, Kum Kum warned that we couldn't reveal the contents of our chosen book to anyone else and that all the books would disappear when the fifth floor mission started. He wished us luck in choosing a book we wouldn't regret before disappearing. Soon, everyone started searching for a suitable book, most heading to the category that best fit their class. Unexpectedly, the guide suggested I choose a book titled SSS Rank Returner's Monopoly of Connections from the novel section. Looking at the book, I doubted whether this novel could really help me with the mission. As I read through it, I became more convinced it was just a trashy fantasy novel. Meanwhile, everyone else had chosen books related to their class, Jun Ho picked a swordsman technique manual, Sei Yong chose a fist martial arts manual, and Yi Seo selected knowledge of the Eastern physician. I began to regret my choice, thinking I should have picked a sword technique or martial arts manual. Watching Sei Chang happily build a tent effortlessly, I wondered what kind of book he had chosen. Hearing strange noises from a corner, I saw Sun Seo Yun angrily hammering a rabbit doll, her frightening expression making me decide to avoid her for now. As time ran out, the fifth floor began, 
and we were transported into a classroom among students. Time temporarily stopped, and we felt ourselves becoming younger. Sei Chang cried out after realizing he had lost all his muscles. We seemed to have returned to our student days to fit the mission background. Sei Yong looked the same but with a shaved head, Yi Seo looked good even younger, and Seo Yun in glasses appeared very different, causing her to feel embarrassed. Just then, Kung Kung's voice came through the broadcaster, telling us the fifth floor mission was role-playing. We were in another dimension where humans and monsters existed, and we were currently cadets at an academy for monster hunters. For the next four days, quests would appear from time to time. Failing a quest would send us to the death mission, so Kum Kum urged us to do our best. We were all stunned by this news. Though I had survived the death mission myself, it would be hard for a normal player to do so. Regretting not choosing a sword technique or martial arts manual, Kum Kum announced he would now give us the memories needed for the roleplay. A bright light of memories hit each of us, overwhelming us. I soon realized these new memories were the content of the novel I had chosen, SSS Rank Returner's Monopoly of Connections. As the time freeze faded, the class resumed normally. If we were in the novel, then we were just extras, and the guy in front of me was the protagonist, O Yun Nam, a returner who knew the future. With the information he had, he monopolized numerous connections with people or places to become the strongest. At this point, the teacher asked a tough question that normal students couldn't answer. In the novel, it was supposed to be answered by O Yun Nam. Just as he was about to answer, I intercepted and answered first, impressing the teacher with my knowledge. I then realized why the guide had recommended this novel to me. There was no need for any sword technique or martial arts manual, I vowed to get all those connections for myself first. After classes, Se Yong was impressed that I knew the answer, but I just lied, saying it was within the memories given to me. E. Seol then asked when the quest would begin. Based on the novel I read, it should be around now, and soon a quest appeared. The mission was to clear the dungeon that appeared on the side of the B-37 building of the academy. Failing to complete the mission within 60 minutes would send us to a death mission. I also knew that the item dropped by the boss monster of this dungeon would play a huge role in the future. In the novel, Oh Yun Nam was supposed to get it, but I wouldn't let him have it. I immediately rushed towards the dungeon. As we entered the dungeon, an orc den, Oh Yun Nam was surprised to see us. Before he could react, I rushed forward and cut through the orc in front of him, saying he wouldn't be the only one capable of finding this place. He was even more surprised when the rest joined the battle, as he didn't remember the cadets in his class being this strong. Sun Seo Yun and I were among the strongest he noticed. Knowing we could steal his rewards at this rate, he immediately drew his weapon. As he threw his golden spear, it cut through tons of orcs before returning to his hand. We were all surprised to see such a powerful attack. While this was expected from a protagonist, he felt even more overpowered seeing him in real life. But I wasn't willing to give up. At the current rate of clearing the dungeon, we should have no problem completing our quest. However, to get the dungeon reward, I needed to kill the most orcs to earn the right to challenge the boss monster. While the current OU Nam was definitely stronger than me, I was an expert at finding monsters. Using my impeccable senses, I rushed towards a group of monsters hiding in the corner. Sun Seo Yun was tricked by me and didn't wish to lose to me this time. As I slashed through the orcs, none stood a chance against me. Sun Seo Yun was also performing well, shooting her way through the horde of orcs. Even when an orc tried to attack her from behind, she easily leaped out of the way. The protagonist, Oh Yun Nam, was also impressive, dominating the orcs with his spear. Yi Seo found the three of us incredible, while Seo Jun Ho thought I looked a little more desperate than usual, assuming I must be working hard to help everyone avoid the death mission. Little did he know I was just competing to get the dungeon rewards. Touched, the rest became even more motivated to fight the remaining orcs. Soon, all the orcs were exterminated, and the boss room appeared. In the end, the person who won the right to challenge the boss was Oh Yun Nam. Despite my best efforts, it wasn't enough. However, I wasn't willing to give up just yet. As Oh Yun Nam was about to enter the boss room, I stopped him, asking him to give me the rights to challenge the boss instead. In return, I would tell him the way to end this chain of regressions. Hearing this, Oh Yun Nam demanded to know who I was and how I knew he was a regressor, pointing his spear at me. I told him it wasn't as important as his dream to see the winter when he was 32 years old. As it turns out, the starting point of the regression was November when he was 17 years old. While others might envy his life, repeating through the prime time from 17 to 32 years old, it was his dream to see the winter at age 32, as he was sick of the never-ending cycle of regression. 
At this time, I offered to tell him how to get out of the curse of regression if he gave me the rights to challenge the boss, knowing he would have no choice but to accept. As expected, he lowered his spear and warned me not to be fooling around with this promise before walking away. Since he had given me the rights to challenge the boss, I finally made it into the boss room and faced the orc boss. However, the boss monster looked much tougher than I expected. I quickly calmed myself down. Even though I couldn't see his level or my guide, I already knew how to defeat it from the novel. Firstly, I needed to be prepared for its warrior's roar. While most challengers would lose their will to fight due to the roar, I could block off my senses with impeccable senses, which don't just amplify them. Hence, a mind attack using sound wouldn't work on me at all. Next, although the boss upper body was as strong as steel, I knew his lower body was very weak. As I swiftly dodged its attacks, I launched a barrage of attacks at its legs. Soon, the boss lost the strength in its legs and collapsed. Before it could react, I jumped at it to launch the fatal blow and received the boss rewards. Back in the academy, Seiyong was upset after losing 11 consecutive rock-paper-scissors games against me. Little did he know it was due to the reward I had just received. It was one of the only two mythical items that appeared in this novel. The first was Gungnir, Yunnam's weapon that would always hit the target it was aimed at. The second was this Ring of Nick, which could greatly increase the user's luck. This will be very useful and a reliable insurance in the numerous turning points to come. Although Yu Nam would have to continue without this item, I intended to give him the information he needed. Not convinced of my luck, Seo Yun was next to challenge me and was willing to bet 3000 gold to win against me. The game wasn't just a game of pure luck but also a clash in agility, and I already had 50 stat points in agility. To make things more interesting, I upped the bet to 5000, and as expected, Seo Yun lost to me. The next day, the cliché scene that appears in this kind of novel was here, the day of evaluation by striking a punch machine. The instructor explained that we would need to use our weapons to attack this crystal, and the magic power value would appear. This score would be used to form our dungeon practical group in two days. Jun Ho was excited to see how strong the cadets were. As the first cadet slashed at the crystal, he got a score of 43, which, based on the reactions of the others, seemed to be considered high. Next, it was Jun Ho's turn, and he got an even more impressive 69 points. Se Yong immediately stepped forward and, with just his fist, scored 75 without using any weapon. While he was boasting about his muscles, a magic bullet fired at the crystal behind him, scoring an even higher point of 98. Looking at my tower teammates, I was proud of the fact that they were much stronger than the cadets. As expected, Oh Yun Nam scored the highest point of 115, gathering praises from everyone around him. If I remembered correctly, he would soon find himself in some trouble. After the test, Se Yong asked me why I didn't get better results, but I merely brushed it off, saying it was pointless if there were no rewards. As it turned out, I had scored a mere 64 points during the test, surprising everyone. But I knew that I could score a high point that could make me a group leader, as I needed to be in the same dungeon practical group as Oh Yun Nam. Suddenly, the second quest began, and our mission was to rescue Oh Yun Nam. The rest did not believe that such a strong cadet would need our rescue. I recalled that when he first entered the academy, he had taught a few thugs a lesson, and among them was the only son of Park Yong Suk, the guild leader of Red Moon, one of the top ten guilds. Park Yong Suk then ordered his subordinates to beat Oh Yun Nam until he was half dead. In the novel, he got lucky and was rescued by someone, as he had the Ring of Nick, which was now in my possession. As we rushed towards the scene, I warned them that for Oh Yun Nam to be in danger, it meant that our opponents would be tough to defeat, but we needed to rescue him at all costs. At this time, Oh Yun Nam was being badly beaten by the underlings when suddenly, one of the thugs was hit by consecutive magic bullets. It was Sun Seo Yun who had attacked first. Se Yong had also rushed forward, and we had no choice but to charge as well, surprising the thugs. The one that was hit was pissed off after being caught by the surprise attack. Although it looked like Seo Yun attacked recklessly, her timing was actually impeccable. Facing such strong opponents, the only way to create a distraction was to launch a surprise attack, and Oh Yun Nam would surely take advantage of this opening. He used this opportunity while the enemies were distracted to summon his spear, launching a counterattack, and swiftly joined forces with us. While he had many questions about why we kept appearing, it wasn't the time to talk about it now as we focused on resolving the situation in front of us first. At this time, Se Yong charged at the blue-haired thug, thinking he was the weakest link, and launched his stone fist attack at him. Unexpectedly, he was blasted off by his aura, sending him flying back. The thug had become furious at our intervention and prepared for battle. As Se Yong was blasted off, 
Blue Hair proclaimed that we had only been exposed to the world within the academy and did not know how scary the world outside could be as he charged towards us. Facing off against them, I instructed Seo Yun to protect us from the rear while Lee Seol would heal those injured before they joined us in the front line. Oh Yu Nam, feeling his injuries recovering fully, did not recall seeing a cadet with such capable healing abilities before. Although the enemies were extremely strong, I knew that the tower would not give us a quest that couldn't be cleared. This was the time for them to use the skills they had gotten from the books. Jun Ho began to use the sword technique learned from his book while Se Yong launched a powerful fist attack from the martial art manual. At this time, Blue Hair was annoyed, thinking that we must be looking down on them after spouting all that nonsense. The three of them launched a powerful attack that we could barely fend off. Even after working together to complete all those tower missions as a team, I thought we had become a united team, but our teamwork was nothing compared to theirs, who were working together at a different level. As a powerful three-man formation, if we could somehow defeat one of them, they would quickly fall apart, but there was no chance to achieve it right now. It was as though we were facing an iron door with no openings. Isiol continued to heal all of us, encouraging us with her support. Blue Hair had begun to feel even more frustrated as he leaped forward, aiming at Isiol to stop her healing. Luckily, Ou Nam fired his spear at him. Even though he tried to dodge it, it was a mythical item that would always hit its target. I knew their formation had started to fall apart, and there was an opening for us now. Blue Hair was surrounded by us while the other two began to rush forward towards him. I could feel their desperation and knew it was because they were being delayed longer than expected. I already knew the reason they were getting impatient from the novel. Before they could attack us, I called out to them, asking if they would be okay since their chairman should be pretty furious by now. My comments caught them off guard, and I continued, saying that the chairman of the Red Moon, Park Yong Suk, was known to be an impatient man. After all, many people had died after getting on his nerves. Hearing my comments, the indomitable wall had begun to show cracks, and as the wall fully collapsed, it was time for our counterattack. Oh Yun Nam quickly launched his spear at Blue Hair while Si Oh Yun followed up with her consecutive shots. I also launched my sword attacks at him, knowing that we just needed to focus all of our attacks on one of them to break their formation. 